The guy they call the Magic Man was arguably one of the best players of his era throughout his 900 plus games in the NHL. But before the world knew how much of a highlight reel Datsuk really was, he was a player struggling to even make it on an NHL roster. For this, we have to go back to the 1996 NHL draft, where a young Datsuk would declare an attempt to become drafted by an NHL team. During that time, Datsuk was putting up respectable numbers in Russia, yet despite this, he would go undrafted not just in the United 96 draft, but also the 97 draft. Datsuk's issue was not that he wasn't good, but he was barely noticed by any scouts at the time. With such little information on Pavel, it was hard for scouts to select a player they knew very little about. But that all changed come 1998, as Red Wings director of European scouting, Hacken Anderson, would head to Moscow to scout defenseman Dmitry Kalanin, but instead got sidetracked by Datsuk, describing him as, quote, this little guy on the other team. Datsuk impressed Anderson so much that he would make a second trip to Moscow to further evaluate the young forward. And when the 1998 draft rolled around, Datsuk was finally able to enter the league, as Detroit would select him 171st overall in round 6 of the draft. Datsuk would remain in Russia up until 2001, when he would be mentored by Igor Larionov, Steve Iserman, and Sergei Fedorov, even being placed on a line with Brett Hall as well. Being surrounded by such skilled players allowed Pebble to slowly evolve into an offensive juggernaut. Or not, especially once Hendrik Zetterberg arrived onto the scene in the 2002-2003 season. The two would instantly click, allowing Datsuk to pop off. Datsuk would finish his NHL career with 314 goals and 604 assists for a total of 918 points. After the 2015-16 season would come to an end, Pavel would announce he'd be returning home and has since been playing in the KHL. Detroit got a massive steal drafting Datsuk so late in the draft, but Pavel wasn't the only player who became a steal in the late rounds. Just ask another former Red Wing who was literally nicknamed the Dominator. And the Oilers bring it back. Shatan across the line, drops it, in for Wade, going in on goal. When looking back on Hashik's incredible career, you would never think that teams once were cautious about selecting him in the NHL draft, but that's exactly what happened, as the young Shek goalie would fall all the way to the 10th round of the 1983 draft. Why you may ask? Well, back in the 80s, teams were worried that players in Europe would be forbidden to play in the NHL due to being behind the Iron Curtain. Dominic Hashik happened to be one of those players, and because of this, Hashik would be taken 199th overall and wouldn't even find out that he was drafted until several months later. He would stay in Czechoslovakia up until 1990, when he would make his debut for the Chicago Blackhawks. Hashik would remain the backup for Ed Belfour for the next two seasons, and showed flashes of excellence, especially during the 1992 Stanley Cup Final, as after a stellar performance in Game 4, despite losing the game, he would catch the attention of the Buffalo Sabres, and the rest is history. Hashik broke out and became the face of the franchise in net for the Buffalo Sabres. His unpredictability made him exciting to watch as he could stop a puck in the craziest ways possible. Over the course of nine years, Hashik would transform the Sabres into a competitive group of players. He would break a total of 25 franchise records and would even take his team all the way to the Stanley Cup Final, losing in one of the most heartbreaking ways imaginable. But he would later get his revenge, winning the Cup as a member of the Red Wings, but whether or not he won or lost, the Dominator always put on a show. Hashik is known as one of the greatest goaltenders of all time, and he changed the way that goalies played the game in more ways than one. The 1979 and 1980 drafts are often credited to being the foundation that eventually built the dominant Oilers of the 1980s. The reason they claim this is that all throughout the draft, Edmonton would snag player after player that would emerge as stars once arriving onto the scene. In fact, Edmonton's first three picks in franchise history all eventually became Hall of Famers, those guys being Kevin Lowe, Mark Messier, and Glenn Anderson. But we're going to be focusing on the 1980 draft, as one pick stands out amongst the rest. Earlier that draft, Edmonton would select defenseman Paul Coffey with the 6th overall pick, and we all know how much of a star Coffey would turn out to be, but 
three rounds later, Edmonton decided to take a gamble. And with the 69th pick in the fourth round, Edmonton would snag a guy by the name of Yari Curry. At the time, not many scouts knew about Yari. In fact, many stayed clear of him, in fear that he would have to serve his military duties in Finland. But that didn't stop Edmonton from selecting Curry, who was considered to be a reach at the time. Luckily for the Oilers, Curry's military duties would miraculously disappear once he became a hockey phenom in his home country, making him able to play on the team. And many could agree that Curry did pretty well. Curry would play over 700 games as an Oiler, scoring 474 goals and 569 assists, becoming one of the most dynamic playmakers of his time and of all time. Curry would go down as the highest scoring European player once hanging up the skates and would be named into the Hockey Hall of Fame in his first year of eligibility. Curry's impact was a big reason as to why his Oilers were as dominant as they were, as Curry was a consistent 100 point player that could not only create separation, but find the back of the net. Speaking of all offensive prowess, let's head to 1982. Doug Gilmore is greatly underrated at times and deserves to be talked about, as he was an underdog before he even entered the league. Gilmore was a beast in juniors and would have been ranked much higher than he was on most scouts rankings, but numerous factors played into Gilmore's draft stock dropping. Despite producing over 300 points in juniors, many feared that Dougie was both too small and too light to play in the NHL. They claimed Gilmore was easy to push off the puck, yet failed to acknowledge his queer offensive talents. Luckily, St. Louis knew he was too good to pass up on, and in the 7th round of the 1982 draft, they took a shot on the young forward. At first, it seemed like Gilmore was nothing more than mediocre. That is, until the 86-87 season, when he would explode. Gilmore would score 42 goals and produce over 100 total points, and wouldn't look back. Dougie would last 19 years in the NHL, and after exploding in St. Louis, he would take his talents elsewhere, such as Calgary and Toronto, where in the 92-93 season, wearing the Maple Leaf, Gilmore would post a career-high 127-point season, showcasing his offensive prowess. Gilmore had his fair share of memorable moments but perhaps nothing is more memorable than his tie-up with Wayne Gretzky in the 93 playoffs. That controversially cost his Leafs the game. Wayne would clip Dougie with his stick, and the ref didn't make the call. Wayne would then score the game-winning goal when he arguably should have been sitting in the penalty box. That, however, doesn't take away the fact that Gilmore is still a Hall of Fame talent who racked up 1,414 points at the NHL level. St. Louis definitely got themselves a steal. For this last part of today's video, we'll be focusing on one draft class in particular. Let's go back to the 1984 NHL Draft, as hidden within the draft's 12 rounds were Hall of Fame talents galore. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Montreal Forum and the 1984 NHL Entry Draft. The first goaltender taken in that year's draft was Craig Billington, who would become nothing more than an average backup goaltender taken in the second round. Taken 19 picks later would be Daryl Ray, who only lasted 27 games in the NHL, split between the Oilers and Whalers. He's more so known as Razor, the Dallas Stars commentator, who had some interesting calls in his career. These two goaltenders, though, are nothing special, but the third goalie taken off the board that year, selected 51st overall, was none other other than Patrick Wall. Coming out of the QMJHL, the former Nordiques fan was now selected by the Canadiens, but his career would eventually go full circle. Wall would be called up in 1985, making his NHL debut, and a year later, he would be named the starting goaltender. Wall took full advantage of this opportunity, playing in 47 games and helping the Habs to the postseason. And this was when Wall shined the best. He would not only help the Canadiens take home a Stanley Cup, but he would also win playoff MVP, becoming the youngest player to win the Con Smite in NHL history. Wall would only take off from there, becoming one of the most clutch goaltenders the world's ever seen. He would help Montreal make another cup final in 1989, and would even win another ring in 93. As most know, Wall would later have a falling out with management after being left in the net during a blowout game in Detroit. This led to Wall wanting out of Montreal, and ironically, he would get traded to the Colorado Avalanche, the team previously known as the Quebec Nordiques. Wall would then win another two Stanley Cups, and would hands down be named a Hall of Famer. Although his coaching record may say otherwise, Wah's overall IQ and vision was absolutely amazing, making him one of the greatest netminders in the history of the NHL. 
Now, to finish out this video, we have perhaps the greatest draft steal in the history of the NHL, as Taro Tujimoto was so good that he wasn't even a real player. Psych, we're not doing that. But to actually finish out today's video, we need to focus on two players. The first being the Golden Jets' son, Brett Hull, as his massive drop in the draft still confuses a lot of people to this day. Hull had a massive season in the BCJHL during his draft year, scoring 105 goals in just 57 games with the Knights, making it odd that he fell right into the Flames' laps in the sixth round of the 1984 draft. Now, it would have made things even better if he blossomed and became a superstar during his time in Calgary, but that wasn't the case. Hull actually struggled to maintain an NHL roster spot in Calgary and would be traded to St. Louis in 1989 in one of the worst trades in NHL history. Now, although Calgary won the cup because of this deal, St. Louis won the pleasure of snagging Hull. As once arriving and having a permanent role on the team, Hull would explode going back to his goal scoring ways. His hammer of a shot made him a lethal threat in the offensive zone, helping Hull find the back of the net with ease. Hull would finish his career with eight 40 plus goal seasons, becoming one of the most prolific goal scorers in NHL history. Now, let's shift three rounds later into the draft, as the LA Kings would supposedly take a gamble by picking Luke Robitaille in the ninth round, 171st overall. Robitaille fell for a lot of reasons, mainly due to concerns about his skating. Many feared that although he was a great net presence, he lacked the speed to play at the NHL level. They also stated that his physical game was lacking as well. Nonetheless, LA stuck with their gut, and within two years, Robitaille was immediately able to step into the NHL, and boy would he shock everyone. Luke would not only produce 84 points, but would take home the Calder Trophy for Rookie of the Year. He would then follow that monster season up with an 100-point campaign. Not too shabby. Robitaille would finish his NHL career a 13-time All-Star, scoring 50 goals twice and producing four 100-plus point seasons. What makes Robitaille's story even more interesting is that five rounds earlier, LA had a chance to select the future Hall of Famer, but instead selected another one, one who never played a single NHL game, as they would end up selecting none other than future MLB pitcher and Hall of Famer Tom Glavin, who had a pretty impressive career of his own. And get him, and the ball game is over, and Tom Glavin has 20, and the Braves have won 100 games. Everybody's going to mob Tom Glavin here. And the Braves come away a winner by a final score of 5 to nothing.